Was Devontae Adams the right move for the New York Jets, or should they have done something else? We'll break that down for you and more today on Locked On NFL Scouting. You are Locked On NFL Scouting with the Draft Dudes, your daily podcast for NFL and college football scouting. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's better than this? It's guys being dudes here on the Locked On NFL Scouting Podcast. We're the Draft Dudes. I'm Joe Marino from Locked On Bills. He's Kyle Krabs from Locked On Dolphins. And we are your NFL experts here with you daily to talk team building across the league on the Locked On NFL Scouting Podcast with the Draft Dudes, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. One issue, a big thank you, shout out, and welcome to our everydayers. Those of you who never miss a single episode, we appreciate y'all being here very, very much. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Place your first $5 bet and you'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Just visit FanDuel.com to get started. We were originally planning on doing some NFL draft specific content. And then Tuesday was like the biggest news day since the league calendar year has started. Detroit getting a couple of contract extensions done. Tom Brady finalizing his ownership with a lot of stipulations <laughs> with the Las Vegas Raiders. Uh, the Steelers potentially making a quarterback change. Amari Cooper to the Bills. And, of course, Devontae Adams to the New York Jets. So, Joe, we have a lot to get to here on the show. We're going to start with Devontae Adams and reuniting with Aaron Rodgers with the New York Jets in exchange for a conditional pick. Uh, it, unless the Jets dramatically turn this season around, it's probably going to be a third-round draft choice that's going uh, to the Las Vegas Raiders as a part of this deal. And uh, what he, we had some speculation about where the Raiders going to eat salary to get what they want. They wanted a two. They get a conditional pick. Uh, how do you think each side came out on the other end of this deal? Well, I, I think the Raiders probably weren't going to get everything that they wanted in terms of a two and not having to eat salary. So they don't have to take on any salary. Uh, which is a win for them. And they had their heels dug in on that. And I think they get a decent pick in exchange, right? A, a three that I, it's not going to be a two, right? It's he has to be uh, like an all pro and be on the roster. If the jets make the AFC championship yeah. game. Yeah. I'm not feeling good about that. So I think the Raiders did fine. Um, and I think the real win for them is that they're, they don't have to deal with any additional cap uh, that taking on any salary there for the jets. Sure, right? Like, okay, he's a good player. He'll help the offense. I think where I'm at with this is I, I think of two things with the Jets. First of all, I mean, you do have a $10 million receiver in Mike Williams that you tacked four void years onto the back of the deal. You got Alan Lazard at $11 million per. You have Garrett Wilson. I've watched the Jets. I don't feel like their biggest issue is wide receiver. I think their biggest issue is their defensive line. And I'm not going to thumb my nose at adding a good player to their team, but – the resources are limited for the Jets, and you can only you can only do so much to help your football team. And, and certainly, this will make Aaron Rodgers better. I don't know that this fixes the problems with the Jets. And oh, by the way, Hassan Reddick was given permission to seek a trade, which when we talked about him earlier in the week, we talked about oh, well, Rosenhaus is coming in here, new representation. How's he going to smooth this over? Well, he's going to smooth it over by getting permission to seek a trade. And if the pick that goes to the Eagles, if he gets traded to an NFC team, the Jets owe a higher pick for the Hassan Reddick trade. Mm. That was part of the original conditions with the pick that they sent when they acquired him was if he ends up getting flicked, uh, flipped back and goes to the NFC, you owe a higher pick because that's sending him back to being a problem that Philly has to potentially deal with. So, I mean, you talk about anticipating and I think we talked in the pre-show about this with with GMs and and getting advantageous conditions for picks what does it say about Philly that they already threw something in there with the conditions when they traded us on Reading in the first place that they thought to add a condition of if he gets sent back to the same conference we get a higher pick so um Aaron already threw Mike Williams under the bus as far as and was he even running an in-breaking route on that play? Like, I know you, you've yeah. done the L22 film review. Yeah. It looked like we're just running verticals, and he flips his eyes inside. But he didn't, like, run a dig. 
He's he, no. he kind of ran a C or a, a outside the to the edge of the numbers type of vertical route that I guess Aaron was thinking he was just going to carry on the red line, but he never really got off the red line. He just looked inside instead outside. I thought. So, according to Aaron Rodgers, who took the opportunity to throw uh, Mike Williams yeah, under the bus, under the bus at the end of the game, because surely it wasn't Aaron Rodgers, and then did it again on McAfee the next day and said. You know, there, we we should all be held to the standard. Okay, um, we had we had two verticals. It was Lazard down the seam, and supposed to be Mike Williams down the red line. And in defense of Aaron Rodgers, I'll I'll criticize Aaron Rodgers a minute. But in in defense, he didn't hold the red line. He he took an inside release and took the vertical route inside the. I mean, outside the numbers, like. Mm-hmm not inside the numbers relative to the numbers. Yes. So he wasn't where he was supposed to be, but in watching the play, I don't think it was hard for Aaron Rodgers to be able to adjust his throw because I think he had him. Like if he just throws the ball correctly there, he has him. And I a spot throw or whatever, but like you weren't pressed. It pressing. wasn't though. It was still would have been underthrown if, if he was where he was supposed to be from a I understand that. Airport. If Aaron Rodgers adjusted his throw based on where Mike Williams actually right. was, right. Now they're going to get a completion. That's the sales pitch to do the Devontae Adams trade, right? And I feel well, like last I, last week I was like, getting Adams doesn't solve your biggest issues. And you're like, yeah, but it would help with the chemistry as far as like guys seeing things the same way. So right. now now the role's reversed where you, <laughs> you did the monologue and said, it doesn't help them where they, they have their biggest issues. And I agree with you. But that play encapsulates, I think, why they are justifying doing this because you have a receiver in Devontae Adams who sees and, and understands how to see the game the same way that Aaron does, where it's right. very clear none of the other guys on the roster really do. They've had the last three weeks, the Jets have had a chance late in the late in the fourth quarter, Aaron Rodgers with the ball in his hands to to have a game winning drive, and they have yeah. not been able to do it, right? So that that's gonna help their operation. It's just they're two and four, and I don't like their I don't like their defense, Kyle, and, and that's supposed to be the strength of this team. And injuries are compounding on the, on on their defense for sure, but I, I just don't think they have the defensive line. It's not the same. It's not the same as it's been in recent years, and so this will help their football team. But they're two and a half back in the East, right? I, I mean. I think that it's a jumbled up conference, but come on, are they really going to do this? Because they have to. It's for every game you drop at this stage, that's two that you have to win down the stretch elsewhere to make up the difference, right? Never mind the head-to-head. Now, the head-to-head, you have another game at Buffalo Week 17. Right. If you win that game, obviously that that helps to soften the blow from from what happened on Monday night. But um, like the Minnesota loss, to go from potentially three and two to – Two and three. Okay, you want to get back up one game over 500. Well, now you got to win two to do that. And they've had three consecutive games that have broken that way that that has really prompted this to be rubber meets the road time for New, yeah. New York. And you're at Pittsburgh on Sunday night football next week. And I know Pittsburgh's banged up on their offensive line. Does that kind of help New York with the issues that they're having with the performance of their defensive line and and but Pittsburgh, as we're going to talk about later in the show, has a quarterback change coming. So what's what's that going to look like? That's a really fascinating and, and high leverage game for New York, where if you drop that one, like, yeah, you're at New England the following week, but then you have Houston for Thursday night football to close the month of October. And Houston's looking like a tough out. So like, this is very high urgency time for the New York Jets. What level of success do the Jets need to have for this to all make sense. Like they have to win the Super Bowl, right? The, the whole thing, the Aaron Rodgers thing, the Devontae Adams thing, with the way that they've mortgaged cap space, the way that they've traded away draft capital. Is there going to be a Super Bowl championship to show for, for it at the end of all this? No, I don't think so. Makes you question a lot of things. But they're they're already down this road, so you might as well see yeah. as far as yeah. I'm concerned, like it doesn't do you any good to be one foot in a one foot in and one foot out now. You you're might not as wrong well about that. because you've already fired the coach. I mean, take the Joe Douglas tenure back to when it started. And I think Connor Rogers had this point on the timeline the other day. His first objective was to fix Sam, the Sam Darnold situation. 
And then he got a chance to draft a quarterback in the top three. And then he got a chance to bring mm-hmm. in a veteran quarterback. <laughs> and if none of this happens, like Joe's gone anyway. Or he yeah, should be, in, in my mind, from like a, a team building and like opportunities and what you've done with your opportunities perspective, like if this thing goes nuclear or blows up in your face and you go eight, and nine, or you go nine and eight or and make the playoffs or just miss the playoffs and losing the wild card round, like what's the path forward from here? Do you want Joe Douglas picking your next head coach or if you're Woody Johnson? Are you going to pick the next, co- next head coach and keep Joe Douglas? Like, the- mm. Flush, you got to flush you know it all I mean? and embrace right. the suck. You gotta, so I mean, for, from a Joe Douglas perspective, it's it's now or never. It's yeah. got to happen now. So I get why they did the deal. The Jets, not the only AFC East team trading for a wide yeah. receiver. The Bills at Amari Cooper. We're breaking that down for you next. Be sure to stick with us. When you're hiring for your small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help you find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. LinkedIn isn't just another job board. LinkedIn helps you hire professionals that you can't find anywhere else, even those who aren't actively searching for a new job but might be open to the perfect role. In a given month, over 70% of LinkedIn users don't even visit other leading job sites. So if you're not looking on LinkedIn, you're looking in the wrong place. On LinkedIn, 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. So hire professionals like a professional on LinkedIn. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NFL. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NFL to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Prize Picks is America's number one daily fantasy sports app with over 5 million active members. Prize Picks is the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Unlike on other apps, Prize Picks, it's just you against the numbers. All you do is pick more or less on two to six player stat projections and watch the winnings roll in. Prize Picks is the only real money daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. So that way your lineups stay in play, even if one of your players gets injured. So download the Prize Picks app today and use code Locked On NFL and get fifty dollars instantly when you play five dollars. That's code Locked On NFL on Prize Picks to get fifty dollars instantly when you play five dollars. You don't even need to win to receive the bonus; it's guaranteed. Prize Picks run your game. I feel wrong starting this segment. I know you did; you've done a whole show on it already, but yeah. uh, the Bills. What second straight year buyers before the deadline? They usually do something. Yeah, they've multiple years in a row. But this they've, is like a big, like third round pick, two years in a row being dealt. Yeah, yeah. Russell Douglas oh. last year, this year for for Amari, Amari Cooper. Cooper. How Bills, about, go ahead. I was just gonna say, how about Amari Cooper? Like two years later, three years later, getting traded for draft pick that was two rounds higher than what he was dealt with when he got traded from Dallas to Weird. Cleveland in the first place. Fourth time he's been traded in his career, man. It's yeah. crazy, right? Never it's been crazy. a free agent. It's insane. Yeah, it's really weird. Highly um, successful wide receiver, multiple big contracts. Never yeah. been a free agent, right? Um, he's on the Brandon Cooks plan, right? You're not wrong about it. that's a good parallel <laughs> to draw. Um, and the Bills, the Bills had some draft capital. They still have two second round picks and and three fourth round picks next year. So they had mm-hmm. some some capital to work with there, but. Obviously, the the Bills needed help at wide receiver. Uh, they're facing a ton of man coverage uh, for the second year in a row, and they need guys that can get buckets. And on one hand, they certainly embrace this "everybody eats" mentality, and I think at times it's worked for them. But when you started to play these defenses that are going to play middle of the field closed man coverage and dare you to get buckets on the perimeter, you know, Matt Collins and Marquez Bell is scantling and. Keon Coleman at this point just not really going to be able to do that. So the the idea of okay, Kolo Shakir, Dalton Kincaid, your middle of the field guys, you got your X Factor and Curtis Samuel, and then you got these big bodies that are going to win leverage battles on the perimeter. That just wasn't happening with enough consistency. So the Bills go out and make a move for Amari Cooper, uh, give up a, a three, and then a, a pick swap of uh, of day three picks as well uh, in exchange for Amari Cooper, who can be the guy that hopefully for the Bills, can go out and get some buckets when uh, Josh Allen needs to get a bucket. And, um, you know, I, Cooper's what? He's he's 30, turned 30 back in June. Expiring uh, not, contract. Expiring contract. So yeah. that'll be interesting to see how that all unfolds. And uh, obviously not having his best season. I don't know how anybody could play well in Cleveland right now offensively. But, you know, 1,100 yards for the last five seasons is most yards of his career last year with Joe Flacco, a guy that's had a lot of different production 
with different receivers, whether it's Jacoby Brissett or Joe Flacco or Prescott or, or Derek Carr, that's kind of used to being traded. So I, I feel like there's a lot of good here for the Bills to make this move on, uh, at a position of need. It's just a matter of now, how do you get this thing onboarded and, and allow him to really help your offense? I'm, I'm glad you made the point about like the books for Buffalo with dra- like draft capital, right? And you mentioned them having additional draft capital that they're expected uh, to be able to have. And I think that's a a team management element that can at times kind of get overlooked. Like everybody has so many picks on any given year that if you want to make a move or be aggressive, like you, you can do that. But the domino effect and detriment of, of doing that and doing that repeatedly or multiple times and, and not having done the legwork on the other end of it in the off season, like when the draft rolls around to like take some opportunities to trade down or, or getting compensatory picks or like whatever that looks like, that becomes where you see, I think, a lot of the uh, narrowing of the funnel as far as like your talent acquisition and and balance of your roster. Uh, and you're you're not going to hit on all your picks, right? So when you pick at a lower volume, that variability that happens inevitably takes its toll on your roster. Um, so I want to turn that around and look at it from like a f- forward looking. Future, how active do you expect the Bills to be in free agency next year? Like, I don't, I off the top of my head, I know they oh. were in a pretty tight situation yeah. this past year and had to be pretty passive early, particularly in the compensatory window. You don't expect them to be active again, overly active again this upcoming March? No, I think, I think their, their priority is going to be the draft class three years ago that they've players have just emerged Christian Benford, Terrell Bernard, yeah, uh, James Cook, Khalil Shakir, and then Greg Rousseau. I think that's any money that the bills have, that's where it's going. And then they, they still have 10 draft picks, including a one, two twos and three fours as things currently stand. So I think they're going to continue. Like they had a big foundational draft last year. They had 10 draft picks. Yeah. And so I think it's a can continue to add youth and take care of your young players and, um, I think it's a lot of what Baltimore is. I think the reason that they're where they are right now is because they have done a great job of maintaining a lot of draft capital and no, it yeah. hasn't all worked, but they have this pipeline. So that way they're, they're able to say goodbye to a lot of players and okay, we've got Travis Jones and David Ajabo and Andrew Voorhees. And you know, the list goes on and on of different players that they're able, Isaiah likely justice Hill, just these players, Brandon Stevens players that these keep drafting and eventually you're going to get, a lot of good players if you continue to do that and have a system in place for development and, and consistency with the coaching staff. That's what allows you to be a sustained winner. So so this is this is where I'm taking this conversation. I'm glad you went there. Um, there's a lot of parts of the Patriot way that were just Tom Brady being Tom Brady, right, and mm-hmm. being married with Bill Belichick. But one thing that the Patriots always did pretty well was they would trade for and acquire veteran players they would play better in that environment than they were playing in their previous place. And they would get a jolt in their stock. And then those players, their contracts would expire and they would sign contracts elsewhere. And the Patriots would get compensatory picks that were equal to, or sometimes greater than the pick that they paid to get the player in the first place. You just get it a year later because you have to wait until the following season passes through. You think there's a chance the bills get a a decent compensatory pick? Like, Oh, the, the highest you can get is a three. Mm-hmm. But if you're Amari Cooper, wide receiver market is what the wide receiver market is. If Amari Cooper starts looking like Amari Cooper that we know Amari Cooper is capable of being, I, I would imagine he's at least knocking on the door before. Like if the Bills choose not to retain him. So that's where I think yeah. it's like, oh, you gave up a three for an expiring contract. Like you have to re-sign that. No, you don't. I don't think you do. Because of if that's what your situation and spending is going to look like, you have the potential to recoup a pick that you lease to the league, theoretically, or another team for 12 months. And it might be a trade down because it's going to be a lower round pick unless Cooper goes absolutely crazy and then lands like a top of market wide receiver contract, which I don't think that he would at this point. No, I I don't think because he'll be 31. There'll be his age 31 season next year. But also, I think if you look at, I mean, just Gabe Davis, the Bills let him go. They're scheduled to get a fourth round I, compensatory. Four. Pick. A four, yeah. And it was a three-year, $39 million <laughs> deal. 
Like Amari Cooper should get something at least like that. Yeah, like third. That's thirteen million per. So like a, a Cooper can't get fifteen and kind of get you right back into that fourth round range. It, yeah, I, I mean as long as there's nothing funny, like you know that compensatory free agents are weird. I know there's void years on the back of Cooper's deal. You know, I I I want to make sure that that's totally accurate. But yes, I mean you could. That's a good way to to reconcile if you have a level of concern about it being a. a I don't think that round applies for a one year rental because they're not the team that's that has the void dollars committed. Right. And that was a big thing with Cooper is that the bills bills have like less than $5 million in cap space. They were pretty limited right. on who they can bring in. You only had to take on $807,000 of salary to, to add Amari Cooper to your football team. Because the Browns restructured his contract right. because Back they restructured March. everybody's contract yeah. because that's how their salary cap management works. Yeah. And then you start one in five and you gave somebody a lump sum bonus at the cost and expense from a cash flow perspective of trading him to a team. And and I guess maybe that's, that's where the value comes back. And Cooper was traded two years ago for a fifth round pick or, or was two or three years ago for a fifth round pick two and a half years ago for a fifth round pick. Yeah. And to get a three now, maybe that's because what well, it is because you paid the lump sum with the restructure and ate the salary in the way that the jets didn't do with Devonte Adams. So it's just it's it's funny all the layers that are contributing to values of players and market of players and but that's why we do this show. This is exactly why we do this show because of all of the different things that have to go into a singular decision that on its surface is the Bills added Amari Cooper on the same day that the Jets added Devonta Adams. That's a great move for them. One thing we know about the NFL, Kyle, wide receivers get traded. Yes. All right, we're talking Lions handed out a couple of extensions, and the Steelers are benching Justin Fields for Russell Wilson. That and more on the other side of it, folks. Be sure to stick with us. Hey, NFL fans, you can start the season with a big return on FanDuel, which is America's number one sports book. So when you get that hunch in the middle of the game, you can check out the latest stats. You can see live play-by-play and so much more on the same place where you where you uh, place your bets, which I love, man. I uh, I really enjoyed the, the live in-game betting, and so – it is cool that you can go right there. You can see all the the play by play, the stats, see where everyone's at, and then you can go. Okay, on this next drive, yeah, I think player X is going to catch a pass, or I think the result of the drive is going to be a field goal or a touchdown. It's been really fun. Not to mention, of course, the player props, the lines. It's all there for you. The over unders. Check it out over at Fanduel, and they got a great deal for you right now. You will get started with two hundred dollars in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first five dollar bet. Check it out, folks. That's Fanduel.com to download America's number one sports book. So where do you want to go? Do you want to do the Lions? I mean, Ali McNeil is turning into a really nice player for them, gets a contract extension. David Montgomery is a nice free agent hit for them. Tom Brady, uh, not allowed to do anything. Yeah, let's but still going to show up and call games on Sundays. <laughs> let's, let's talk about the, Let's go Lions, Steelers, Tom Brady, and get out of here. Okay. Lions, Aleem McNeil, four years, $97 million. That's $24.25 million AAV. Aleem McNeil, now you're it's top it, 10, right? Four, it's fourth. He's the fourth highest paid wow. defensive tackle in the NFL. So Chris Jones at 31.75. Wilkins, 27.5. Namdi Matabuik, 24.5. Aleem McNeil, 24.25. That's ahead of Quinn and Williams. It's ahead of Derek Brown. It's ahead of Jeffrey Simmons. It's a healthy contract. It's yeah. Dexter Lawrence is going to hold out. I'm sure he's sitting over here at 21.9 million. He's $10 million a year underpaid. Yeah. Let's let's not wait. You got guys that are good guys to play and pay, pay them because pay him. <laughs> the, the league dollars are only going to go up. This is yeah. the latest embodiment of that. I think it's just, this speaks to, and I want to couple this with the David Montgomery extension, two years, 18 million and Dave, David Montgomery. Now the sixth highest paid AAV running back in the NFL. And, and maybe you could look at these two players and say, well, you know, is Aleem McNeil the pass rusher? David Montgomery's a power back. This is the culture of Detroit, man. Like they're building something really special there. And obviously they have they were able to enjoy kind of a modest team with, you know, Sewell and St. Brown and, and on lesser deals. Right. And, yeah. and this is becoming more expensive. Right. But that's a that's a good thing. But these are these are identity pieces for them. These are tone setters. This is part of what this football team wants to be. I think McNeil and Montgomery very much embody everything that they wanted to mean to be a Detroit Lion. And I think handing out these types of extensions 
is no small deal here as the Lions continue to, to kind of pay everybody right now. Uh, it sends the right message that, hey, we're going to drop you, we're going to develop you, and if you do it, you're going to stick around and we're going to pay you. And it feels like a lot of people want to be part of the Lions. And so it's cool. I mean, I mean, look, you never like not every contract is going to be a hit. And you can ask yourself questions about both of these deals. But how do you not love everything about the direction of the Lions right now? I think the the question the question that's probably going to exist exist with Detroit is how reliable will their quarterback play be in the high pressure, high strain situations late in the year? And to Jared Goff's credit, he played awesome in the playoffs last year. You know, I, I thought he was really good. Um, probably the the three best games he statistically played in his playoff career. And right, that includes a, a Super Bowl run, a n- number of other playoff appearances. Um, but I think that's that's the question. And the fact that they were proactive in getting a Jared Goff extension done uh, probably helps them long term. But they also have. Right now, three years, like the three draft classes that they have invested into this team, they're just starting to get into the commitment of paying a lot of those players. By the time it comes time to pay, the the question is, how do you, who are the players you phase out as you're phasing new big contracts in, right? And that's been a big thing for me and my coverage of the Dolphins. And they accelerated that timeline on themselves because they drafted by volume in 2020 and 2021, and they would have drafted by volume in 2022, but they got a first-round pick taken away, and then they made a trade at the at the trade deadline to get rid of another first-round pick. So uh, I have had to live and experience that part of it when you take the kind of pick-by-volume method that the Lions did, and that's just the question for me that I'm going to have is, um, but they, they have a healthy cap forecast as like looking at the multi-year summary for them right now. So that's going to be the question for me is, is who are you phasing out as you are phasing in uh, for Detroit? Now I know Joe wanted to get to the Raiders. Welcome back. Next, or the Steelers next with Russell Wilson. And then we're going to finish with the Raiders. Isn't the conversation right. really simple here with Pittsburgh and, and choosing to to start Russell Wilson? I don't understand the move. You're four and two with Justin Fields. Has Justin Fields been performing at a level that makes you say, "Yeah, he's unquestionably our guy"? No, but we know what Russell Wilson is. We know what he is. There's no upside. There's zero upside. Why not allow Justin Fields to continue to play and? learn more about him and his fit with Arthur Smith in this offense and feel like maybe he's your guy beyond this year. There's just zero upside other than Mike Tomlin probably feels like he made a commitment to Russell Wilson. And so he has to get his opportunity. Exactly, I think that's exactly what it is. And I think Russ's leash is going to probably be pretty short. Just wasting time. All right. So we both, we feel the same way about that. Can we talk about Tom Brady and he's the 5% owner of the Raiders now. And in doing so, keeping in mind, he's a signature broadcaster for Fox Sports, right? Yes. These are the restrictions that he has now on him. He's not permitted to be in another team's facility. He's not permitted to witness practice. He's not permitted to attend broadcast production meetings, either in person or virtually. He's prohibited from publicly criticizing game officials or other clubs. That'll be a fun line to walk on the broadcast. He's subject to the NFL's gambling policy, and he's subject to the NFL's anti-tampering policy. I don't know, like, felt like they threw everything possibly that they could at Tom to be like, hey, maybe maybe doing both of these things isn't a good idea. And he's like, okay, I'll figure it out. <laughs> Another set of rules for Tom Brady, right? Right. I, I mean, I can't speak for him. You know what I mean? Like, he obviously, he, he wants to have a legacy as a broadcaster. Mm-hmm. And he, I mean, cool. Yeah. I mean, you get to be 5% owner on the Raiders. Like, but what, what is, is it, is it a pathway for him to becoming eventually a majority owner? Is that the benefit of becoming a 5% owner right now? I mean, it's, 
I mean, obviously investing in football teams, if you got the money is a pretty good thing to do. I mean, they're, they're continuing to become more and more valuable. Like I get that, but I don't know. It's to add all this up. Kind of, kind of strange to me. You just feel like Tom's trying to find as many different ways to stay busy in retirement life as possible. Right. Why it was so strange to me, man. I, I do wonder what the long-term implications are for Tom's role with broadcasting. Because apparently he's going to be like a part of the football operations in Las Vegas. Well, then he's got that. Then that's got to be his focus. There's no sense right. in him if, if, broadcasting if, a game. And, of and if you're not going to do that, then that, that experience is going to be a disaster, right? Yeah. Like if you're going to be one foot in on that or one toe in on that with one foot, that, that requires... I don't know that 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 requires a full time a lot of people's attention and focus. So for you to just kind of like be there, and then you're not even gonna be at the stadium for the the Raiders on game day because you're gonna be calling other games. It's weird. It's right? weird. So I I do wonder the sustainability of the pace in which Tom is is doing all this, uh, and, and that's kind of where my attention has shifted with the Brady dynamic as far as. Anything and everything under the sun, he's got a hand in it right now. Oh, we all know it's Tom Brady's world, and everyone else is living in it just like it's been Come since 2000. It's it's over. <laughs> his play, his his torment of your team is over. Team Belichick, right here, <laughs> Joe Marino could not be me. That's going to do it for us here on Locked On Bills Scouting Up Cock Craps. He is Joe Marino. You can find us on YouTube or wherever you list your favorite podcast. We appreciate you guys for checking out the show. Make it a great rest of your day. Uh, we are doing picks tomorrow. We're previewing week seven. Week seven. The NFL see Joe, seven is half of 14, which means we're halfway to December football, middle of October. I was like, man, I don't think I don't think that's halfway to the end of the season. I don't know. It's not. It's not. That's why I didn't go there. But <laughs> it is flying by. And we are going to be there every step of the way. And then we'll be there every step of the way in the offseason as your team tries to right the ship, but uh, we hope you will find us on YouTube or wherever you've listened to your favorite podcast. We appreciate you guys checking out the show and we will talk to you all again tomorrow.